grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. There's an old phrase, or at least it's an old phrase for me, maybe not as many for many of you, but let sleeping dogs lie. Perhaps even if you don't have dogs, you know what this phrase means. Now, I, on the other hand, have three dogs, and I know exactly what this phrase means. It's not that any of my dogs have a mean bone in their body. In fact, well, they are probably the sweetest animals, but once they are awakened, they have a ton of energy, and they are moving constantly. So for us, we like to let our dogs sleep. However, this phrase, as you know, is referring to stirring things up. Isn't that exactly what this phrase is about? To let sleeping dogs lie, because, well, rather than start an argument, start something that you know may end in, with trouble, just let it be. And isn't that what many of us prefer? Most of us. Although some of the time we have a hard time just letting sleeping dogs lie, don't we? We don't like things to just be as they are. It's not that we like change. No, change would not be something that would be in our vocabulary. But we do like to fix things that are broken. We like to work on things. God has made us creatively for so that we will make changes when things are not right. And if we look at God and we look at the way he acts, isn't that exactly how he works? He doesn't just let things be. He's not a sedentary God who just sits up in heaven and waits all day for our prayers to rise up to him, taking a nap the rest of the time. He doesn't, he's not just sitting there looking out over us, waiting for us to mess up. No, our God is active among us, so active so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us, so much so that he continues to be involved with us each and every day. Just think about the promise of Christ in, in the Gospel of John as Jesus was preparing to go to the cross. He told the disciples, I will send a counselor after me, that is the Holy Spirit, to be with you. Our God is not a sedentary God. He's not a God who just lets sleeping dogs lie, is he? He's a God who's actively involved each and every day to our good and sometimes, well, it takes us a while to realize to our good. Now looking at our Old Testament lesson today, God was certainly active, wasn't he? Ezekiel chapter 37, we look at it and we see God bringing Ezekiel to this valley of dry bones. And if you're not familiar with Ezekiel, well, about the time of his writing was 586 B.C. And let's put it this way. This was not a good year for the people of Israel. In fact, it'd be better to say this was a bad year for the people of Israel. Because if you know your Old Testament history, what happened in the years coming up to and it happened in 586 B.C.? Well, 586 B.C. marked the fall of the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah. It marked the fall of Jerusalem and the beginning of the Babylonian exile. So you have the people of God probably asking the question, where is God? Is God not up above waiting for us? They probably were looking around and wondering. And today we have the beginning of our Old Testament lesson with Ezekiel. And he has entered. It is not a graveyard because great there would be burial. But all of these dry bones, these were the results of a battle that had been lost. These were the results of the people of Israel losing. And you, when you look at that, when you look at the beginning of our Old Testament text today, you see God's hard work. You see the result of his judgment, his punishment. And many of us would say rightfully so, wouldn't we? When we look at those people of Israel, how many of us look at them and say, well, they were some rather sinful people, weren't they? We adjust our garments a little bit and stand there and we say, well, look at them. God gave them his law. They couldn't follow that. God gave them a covenant. They couldn't follow that. God gave them chance after chance after chance by sending prophets to them. And they still couldn't follow that. So God's hard word had to come. God's word of judgment had to come to his people. And that word of judgment was not only for the people surrounding them, the evil nation surrounding them, but ultimately ended with their fall and into the Babylonian captivity. And so you probably had the people of God looking around and saying, where is he? Isn't he the one who said in his covenant with Abraham that he would be with us? That, his enemy, that our enemies would be his enemies. Our friends would be his friends. 
Isn't that his promise? Well, we, again, like to stand out from the picture there. We like to look down on these people. And we like to say, well, of course God is finally judging them. He deserves that. Of course God is finally bringing to them what they have been owed for years and years. We like to stand out of the picture a little bit, and we like to pass judgment, don't we? Sometimes maybe it's not over the people of Scripture, but maybe it's in our families. Well, that person, well, they've betrayed my trust so many times. That person has hurt me over and over again. I've done my Christian duty. I've forgiven them, but they didn't repent. How many of you ever said that? looked at those people in your family, you looked at those loved ones and said, well, I have done my part. There's nothing more I could do. And now it's time for the hard words, those hard words of judgment, those hard words of, oh, I will never forgive you. And it's not just the people in our family, is it? When we start to think about it, it's not just those people we pass judgment on, those people that we say those hard words to. In fact, many of us are ready to say those hard words every single day. Perhaps as we're driving down the street or walking into the grocery store and we see that guy who's dirty and grimy, who has things under his fingernails, who has his hand out, and we shake our heads and say, well, what is he addicted to? Or maybe it's those people who have the foreclosure sign in their front yard. And we say, shake our heads and say, well, they bought more house than they should have bought. Or maybe it's that as we look on the other end of the spectrum and we shake our heads at those people who, who have those nice cars, the fancy homes, the fancy boats. Sound familiar at all? Many of us, we like to stand there in the place of God. And we like to pass judgment, don't we? We see those hard words of God in the Old Testament, and we think that, well, it's our turn to lay out those hard words. We're good Christian people, aren't we? We've lived those lives in the church that we should, right? We go to church, we read the Scriptures, we pray to God. So, so shouldn't we carry out His hard words? Well, the answer, like many things, is yes and no. Many times our first instinct will, to do so, will be to do so in a sinful way, won't it be? To be, do so from the seat of judgment, won't we? We'll want to say, well, you did this wrong or that wrong. However, when we say yes, we should share those hard words. It should not be of a seat of superiority. It should not be from a seat of judgment. It should not be from a place of, of power, but it should be looking at our own lives and, re- look and realizing how sinful we are. When we look at those people who are different than us, those people who we are ready to pass judgment on, we should first look at our lives and examine our lives before the Lord. And on the other hand, many of us, when we look at our lives, we realize that we're really in no place to pass judgment if you were to look at the scale, to look to hold up the scale of judgment, is there ever any time that it's balanced? The answer is no. We are all sinners and we have all failed to keep God's commands. We are all sinners and we have all lived, lived according to our own lives instead of God's plan for our lives. When we look at that scale, when we hear those hard words, judgment, condemnation. That is when we need to hear also those words of grace. Those people with those wounds that we talked about earlier, those people with those wounds, they had heard the hard words of Christ. They had heard His words of judgment. They had heard His stinging words of wrath. Let's read a few verses earlier in Ezekiel. But now as we come to Ezekiel 37 today, we see God's words of mercy. We see that He has heard the voices of those dry, weary bones. We know that He has heard our voices that are dry and weary because we were dead 
to our test test, we will go to sleep. He heard our voices in weakness, and he sent his son, our Savior, Jesus to us. He sent Jesus to revive those dead bones, to revive our broken spirits. Already in our baptism, as he said those hard words, as he said those words, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He was already speaking the hard words that he would say on the cross. The hard words of sacrifice. He was already prepared to give his life for each of us before we ever realized how sinful we were. That we were dead in our trespasses. Dead. Separated from life. Christ came forth and he breathed into our life. Our God is indeed not a sedentary God. He is a God who works in our lives today. He is a God who came 2,000 years ago to redeem a people lost, a people condemned. He is the God who said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Yes, we are still going to have our physical death on this earth. Yes, we are still going to die and we are going to go through the pain. But we will not do so alone. And it will not be a permanent death. That death, That death is nothing because Christ has given us life. He has defeated death. He has won victory over death. And so when we hear those hard words of God, those words are words that sometimes we don't want to hear. But they're not words of anger, but rather words of compassion. When God speaks those words of compassion to us, It is just like a father who disciplines his daughter. A mother who disciplines her son. Out of love, we discipline our children. And we do so. So that they will grow up knowing what is right and what is wrong. God speaks those hard words to us. So that we will know. So that we will know what is right and what is wrong. But that is not where he leaves us. In Romans 8, so beautifully, Paul records this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, in that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. See, God could not just turn a blind eye on our sin. He couldn't just turn away and say, oh, it's okay, that's fine. But He is a holy, He is a righteous, He is a just God. And He looked at our sinfulness and He said something has to be done. And so that something that had to be done was He made the hard decision of sending His Son Jesus, His one and only Son, to die on the cross for us. And in that hard decision, He paid the price for all of our sin. He exchanged our death with His death. He exchanged His life for our life that we would live with our Savior forever. Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 53, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was punished for our sins. But what that punishment has brought us. That punishment for Christ was our punishment. That He gave us instead peace. He instead gave us hope. And every Sunday we come together. We take time to hear those hard words of God. And sometimes it's harder than other times as a preacher to speak those hard words. Because you understand that those hard words are not my hard words. But they are God's words. I don't stand in this pulpit as a man who is any better than the rest of you. Did you notice at the beginning of the service, we all join together in confessing our sins before God. I don't stand in this pulpit as a hypocrite who says I have never sinned because I need, like each of you, to come to the table of the Lord and receive that forgiveness. And I stand here at times speaking the hard words of God. But you will know, but but you will know so much more His love. But you will know so much more His forgiveness. So you will know, so you will know that you are dead. But God could not just let those sleeping bones lie. And He breathed into you new life. And through your baptism, He made you His own. And each and every day, He continues to work in us. Each and every day, He continues to send His Spirit to work in our lives. The Spirit, which gives 
us the life-giving words to share with them. It is not our words that we share with people. When we go out and tell people about our faith, it's not our word. It is the word of God. That precious word of forgiveness is not our word. Much like it wasn't Ezekiel's word that brought life to those dead bones, it's not our word. But God speaks through us to bring life to the lost. He sends us to preach that gospel message. And He promises that it will not be in vain. Isaiah says in Isaiah 55, Just as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. That word of God is where the power is. That word of God is what we are to proclaim. And that word of God is what brings that salvation because of that sacrifice of our Savior Christ. And in His name I say, and we say together, Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we do thank You that You have come and dwelt among us and that You have given life to our weary bones. We pray that each and every day we would recognize that we are sinners in need of forgiveness. We pray that each and every day we would recognize that it is not just us who need to hear that gospel message, but there are many people who are lost and dying who need to hear Your love. Lord, help us to be willing servants to go forth to preach Your Word. Help us to remember Your act on the cross, knowing that that it was Your decision to give us life, that it was Your decision to resurrect us, that we may go forth preaching the good news. Lord, we pray that we would ever remember this good news gospel until the day we die, until we pass from this life to the next, knowing that it is not a fi- that it is not final, but our victory has come, that our time with You, that You will then restore these old bones, placing new flesh on them so that we will be a new perfect creation, living in your presence forever. Until that day comes, Lord, reassure us and give us the hope of your resurrection. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.